Thanks, Thanks a lot, ma'am. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Next in the sequence, we have with us our second speaker, Professor Vijay Prakash Singh, who will speak on the topic of mentoring students in online teaching, oblique regular teaching post COVID nineteen. Sir was the former head professor, Department of English and Modern European Languages, University of Lucknow. Sir has been working as a Fulbright visiting professor, Claflin University, South Carolina, United States. Sir's area of interest are 19th century novels, model fiction, travel narrative. He could not be actually present as for the live interaction due to the time gap between the Indian Standard Time and the US. But we are highly indebted, sir for your audio recordings. I extend my profound gratitude for your virtual presence. Star Fred. So good uh, morning to all of you and uh, I'm speaking from a different time zone uh, because I happen to be in the US and uh, I have been asked to speak on, uh, and this is what I would like uh, to speak on, on uh, mentoring of uh, young teachers, uh, you know, as to how in a post-COVID-19 uh, crisis, they should be interacting with their students and uh, what are the priorities that they should, uh, you know, hold out in their online teaching? Because for some time to come, at least, uh, we know that, uh, you know, actual regular routine teaching may not take place for several months to come. So in this whole uh, session where I speak on, uh, you know, how you can, uh, interact better with your uh, students. So, I mean, uh, mentoring is for the younger faculty, you know, those who have put in three years or five years or even maybe 10 years of teaching. And then this whole mentoring process has to be passed on by you as faculty to the students, you see. Now, the first thing that I felt, which is very close to my heart, and which is something uh, we see all around us is on the whole issue of environment on which I feel very strongly. And that is that we are seeing that the environment has restored itself, that uh, there is a great deal of healing that has taken place in nature we find that, uh, you know, reports that are coming to me from India, they say that the skies appear more blue, far, far more blue than it has appeared for a number of years. And that, uh, uh, you know, uh, suddenly you see varieties of birds even in the daytime. And uh, the air is much more uh, fresh than it has been for perhaps decades and, you know, the alarming levels of pollution, atmospheric pollution that we saw, you know, whatever we saw, the SPM levels and, you know, um, whatever carbon monoxide and all that, the, the horrible levels of air pollution, especially in parts of uh, Delhi, you know, UP, which we have been uh, witnessing, we have been seeing those uh, alarming pollution levels are down. Now, with this kind of restoration that nature is manifesting, you know, in cleaner air, even the waters of some of the rivers like Yamunavi here has improved so much. So this may have happened with many rivers where so far industrial effluents were being discharged and that has stopped because they, the factories, the industries have shut down. 
the question, the very important question that all of us as educators, as students, as professionals and other fields need to think about, as common citizens we need to think about, is how we can sustain this level of restoration, this level of uh, healing that nature has shown. Uh, how can we in the smallest way possible in our individual lives uh, manage to sustain this whole uh, level of restoration. Obviously, once things become normal and we go back to work and we start taking out our two-wheelers and, you know, our, uh, our uh, uh, cars, uh, things are going to be, uh, you know, nearly as bad because, you know, initially a few people may come out, some may be a little afraid, and if they, only if they require to come out, they may come out, the elderly may be a little more susceptible, so they will stay back at home. And, but otherwise, most young professionals, older professionals, children, they will all be back in school, colleges and universities will open, and we will find that the level of atmospheric pollution because of vehicular exhaust, all of that, you see, the pollution levels that you see because of traffic in our urban centers, in our cities, in our small towns, that is going to be back again. And what can you do about it, you know, to begin with, when it comes to uh, vehicular exhaust, when it comes to traffic, for example, then uh, I think each one of us needs to think whether we are prepared to start using public transport, which is something that we may not be inclined to do so far. And uh, that may be very important. Uh, now, you have a metro service in Lucknow now, and you know, in some of the other cities like Delhi to several other cities as well. So, uh, you know, rather than just uh, witnessing that it is a major development in our city, can we be able to use the metro as a public transport, a very convenient form of public transport? Many of us, like me, who was so far not so inclined because, you know, it is far more preferable to take out our private conveyance, our cars or our motorcycles and, you know, go to work or for any other job. So that is a very important factor that especially the young people, you have to be prepared to start using public transport. There is a lot of talk of cycles and cycle tracks and things like that. Our cities, unfortunately, are not prepared like European cities like Amsterdam or London or whichever other cities to uh, facilitate or enable citizens to use cycles. We cannot do that giving the congestion that we have on our roads, the huge traffic, the risk, and, uh, you know, uh, the risk of accidents that cyclists uh, face. It's not going to be possible for cyclists, but use of public transport is definitely there. Car pooling to some extent also, I think, would be a very good idea for parents, you know, whose children study in the same schools, for colleagues who go to the same office, you know, so I think carpooling is a good idea. I mean, I'm saying the same things that have been said before, but I think we ought to start taking this more seriously to be able to cut down on our atmospheric pollution, you know, which comes from traffic. I think young people in colleges and universities, some even in our secondary school level, must also see how you can be associated with uh, certain NGOs, green NGOs, which are interested in afforestation, for example. There is a lot of uh, token tree planting, you see, a lot of tokenism that takes place where on one Mahotsav day or Independence Day or some such significant day, uh, hundreds of trees are planted and then there is no follow-up action and you do not know how many have survived or how many have died because of, you know, the harshness of the weather. So that becomes just like a symbolic uh, uh, gesture, symbolic act. 
which is just a form of tokenism. But I think serious afforestation means that you plant a limited number of trees and then you take care of those trees, you nurture those trees as voluntary groups. This is very important. So can young people be motivated and encouraged to join NGOs like this? Because only fighting vehicular emissions or traffic pollution is not enough. We need much more greening of our uh, towns and cities, you see, wherever it's possible. So afforestation movements would be very important. And uh, apart from that, I feel that, you know, if you can look at issues like rainwater harvesting, I mean, India is a monsoon rich country. There is so much talk of rainwater harvesting, but in many places you see, uh, you know, institutional buildings and even private housing. The water of the monsoons, and very often we have very good monsoons, the water goes waste. So issues like greening, tree planting, afforestation, conservation of water, rainwater harvesting, and as I said, traffic pollution, can we look at some of those issues and can we uh, tighten our belts, you see, especially as young people of colleges and universities, can you think of that? And can you, uh, you know, uh, join hands with NGOs that are working in these areas? Uh, if nothing else, you can spread awareness and you can actually get down to the field as voluntary groups participate in some of these things. There are many more opportunities that you have today because there are so many NGOs that are working in these fields and that are doing good work. So apart from that, I thought a major issue is also uh, the issue of uh, uh, polythene ban. Because, uh, you know, take for example a city like Lucknow, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I'm addressing the students of uh, uh, Lucknow. So let me speak about uh, Lucknow. That uh, polythene was banned two times and I don't know, I really do not know what the condition is right now. Uh, I have been a little out of touch for the last eight months. Uh, but uh, every time it is announced that polythene would be banned and then nothing gets seriously done, there is no real implementation. So can we stop using polythene, which is a major non-degradable uh, uh, you know, material uh, from polluting our soil and our air and uh, our uh, water, you see? Uh, and can we start using in our daily individual lives for getting our groceries, our vegetables, whatever? Can we start using cloth bags, simple cholas or bastas, as you would say, you see, or baskets such as the older generation use, rather than using this polythene and scattering it about and dumping kilos of it in our garbage cans, which then, you know, cattle eats and which uh, uh, only uh, makes our soil and our uh, uh, water bodies toxic. Later, it is no use for the media to be reporting that, uh, you know, a cow was operated and kilos of polythene was removed from its system. I mean, this is just a, a symptomatic solution. You can't tackle the symptom. You have to tackle the root of the problem. Why should animals be eating polythene if polythene is banned? You know, there is no point in operating on cows and then make, making that into an achievement. So I think for all state governments, and even ban India, the government of India needs to ban polythene and provide these industrial units as, uh, you know, uh, new sources of livelihood where they can make paper or cloth bags. So questions of livelihood and employment should not come into this whole shutdown, this whole ban. So these are some of the issues. We have to actually look at the issues. It is very easy to say that, you know, take care of your environment or uh, keep the level of the environment as good as it is now. It will not once life begins and, you know, we are back to normal. Uh, this is not going to happen. So I think creating awareness about the environment and the ecology which we are 
sort of uh, living in, that's very important for teachers today, especially for teachers, you know, who are teaching scientific disciplines. Uh, an awareness on this uh, is very important. And so will the students of humanities as much as students of science, any scientific discipline. This is very important. Now, apart from this, I feel that uh, there is a, you know, on media you can see this, there is the whole issue of uh, people being compelled to sit at home because of this sustained lockdown, how much, five weeks there, two weeks, more, seven weeks, nearly two months of lockdown. And what are we going to do at home? Because we were so used to going to the restaurants to eat out or to meet friends or, you know, uh, all kinds of social activities that suddenly boredom stares you in the face. Now, your whole attitude to life is determined by your attitude towards the boredom in your life. How are you going to tackle this boredom? An intelligent student, for example, a creative student, you know, is not going to be easily bored. And why just student, even older people, older professionals, retired people, they should not have to be complaining or grappling with boredom because this lockdown is a golden opportunity for us to realize that uh, there are many ways in which we can use our time fruitfully. And uh, I think uh, at one basic level, you can simply start being more creative with your time. And one of the ways, especially for students to be creative, is to cultivate, if you do not have the habit, to begin to cultivate. But if you have the habit to sustain that in a more regular way, the habit of reading. So I think reading is very important, whether it is online, whether it's through Kindle or, you know, any way. I mean, uh, through any means you can uh, read, whether it's an uh, actual book, because, you know, I mean, many of my generation uh, prefer the hard copy of the book, but I mean, I'm reading online because uh, the library of uh, my campus here in America is closed. The whole campus is shut down. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to the library because even if it is opening for a few hours, I would rather avoid it. So I'm reading books online and, you know, your, uh, the younger generation is so much more uh, uh, sort of uh, clued and more savvy technically. And, you know, you can access so many books digitally. So I think beginning to read, that is good. Whatever the discipline, I mean, it can be, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, literature, it can be uh, so many uh, disciplines in science, so many issues, so many subjects, you know, which deal with scientific uh, discoveries and breakthroughs that you should be reading about. And apart from reading, many of you uh, have been uh, creative in this period. Many people, I mean, not just students, but even otherwise, and they have begun to tap into their creative resources. They are beginning to write poems or then they are painting or then they are writing sh uh, short stories, whatever. It doesn't have to be just this or that. Whatever form your creativity takes, see if you can uh, continue this as a habit. How can you use that time which you spent, you know, hours maybe, looking at Instagram or Facebook or just sending messages and chatting with a friend or idling or sleeping, you know, watching some inane program, some very third class serial on the television. Can you avoid that and continue with this, you know, uh, sustain this uh, new uh, habit that you started cultivating during the lockdown? Can you sustain it and carry it on? What do I mean? Creative things like reading, like writing. Regarding uh, your health, many have chosen now to do yoga. Many have started with meditation, you see. 
it can be these can be very initial fledgling steps but it can grow on to something very significant you can actually get into serious and longer timings of meditation and uh, as well as yoga uh sitting here in america i sometimes listen to religious spiritual discourses i listen to buddhist discourses i listen to i watch rather you know discourses by some of our uh, uh you know same some of our mistakes and it is amazing i mean i am i realize more than ever being so far away from india what a miraculous country ours is to have produced men like uh, you know uh, ramakrishna uh, paramahans uh, ramakrishna paramahans swami vivekananda or sri aurobindo or ramana maharshi or j krishna murthy or then you know sri sri ravi shankar or then the sadguru the whole tradition continues you see from himalayan yogis and rishis the whole tradition has been continuing down Uh, the centuries down the decades so spiritually if we are such a rich country and there is such a uh, treasure such a wealth of wisdom such a wealth of wisdom then i think that the younger generation needs to tap into that wisdom and uh, uh, you need to be able to even see <laughs> to and uh, you know uh, pay attention to some of these discourses because the spiritual life is what in these uh, modern times where there is so much pursuit of the shallow you know pursuit of money pursuit of fame pursuit of power pursuit of position which is not leading to happiness so spirituality comes in here and it is more relevant today than it has ever been before you know even 20 years or 50 years before it's very very relevant so can the young generation and can young teachers inculcate and cultivate this uh, uh, you know interest i mean it, it can start with just a little shoot you see a little plant a little sapling and it can this can grow into a tree you know and you can actually seriously uh, use spirituality to enhance the quality of your life so that uh, these things both for mind and body it can be you know workouts it can be exercises it can be yoga the ancient art of yoga and it can be meditation dhyan these are things which i think uh, you know being uh, uh, limited and uh, sort of hedged in within your uh, home you know you can start practicing you can start cultivating and uh, i feel that sanitation is also a very important uh, area and i really when i was talking about environment i should have uh, spoken about uh, sanitation but let me just bring that up because you know every celebrity government of india releases media publicity that has been going on you know about how important it is to wash hands and you know avoid shaking hands and uh, avoid touching surfaces and keeping surfaces clean keeping houses and offices and public spaces clean we know about all that by now the most illiterate person also is aware about that but sanitation is much wider than just washing hands can we encourage our students as teachers and we must begin to keep their immediate environment outside their homes outside their gates you know in the common areas in the flats or in, uh, apartments where they live or in workplaces in offices where we will get back to work can we keep these areas clean can we prevent our employees at the lower level you know even some educated people are in the habit of for instance uh, you know eating you know chewing spurious kind of uh, products which are very unhealthy you know i am referring to so many things that are there at the market which leads to have 
it's like spitting you know this is a common indian malady whether on the road whether just outside the uh, gates of the house whether you know in the landing of the office uh, even in public spaces you find that even educated people freely spitting especially in north india you know south india i find is so much more cleaner now can this kind of thing be strongly discouraged and uh, can even you know we create awareness at the individual level that we as citizens uh, will dump garbage where with you know it uh, is going to be disposed of so garbage management which i have always felt very strongly about especially in a city like lucknow where i see so many garbage heaps just lying where the municipality is not going to collect it or uh, which even if it is collected you know is such a i saw stinking heaps of garbage which i find in my own neighborhood where i live and in all parts of lucknow many cities of up and many cities of india how is it that you know in the swachh bharat abhiyan cities like indore and bhopal received the first or the second position and no city in india could get the smart city act you see it is because of a lack of will power so i think particularly up needs to really pull up its socks you see as one of the states that are very low on this whole uh, uh, index of uh, cleanliness uh, even in the recent swachh bharat uh, campaigns we saw this that uh, lucknow could never make it and very few, i think just one or two or three cities you know at the most they were there in the count but they were very low in the count and no city to the best of my knowledge was there in the first five or the first 10 uh, a ranking of cities in the swachh bharat campaign so it's not just a question of personal hygiene which we have become conscious about but it's also a question of public hygiene can we avoid this uh, dumping of garbage garbage disposal you see and uh, uh, I mean, looking at garbage disposal as an effective way in which uh, you know uh, uh, we keep our surroundings clean, as well as uh, you know, common habit, as I said, of uh, people sitting in workplaces and around uh, residential areas. It's happening everywhere. So uh, small things like that also. Uh, and if students themselves have been doing this in an unaware way in a casual way you know with a chalta hai attitude who's looking who's bothering how does it matter if i'm doing it in the bathroom or anywhere you see i can sit here i can sit there you as a student studying in colleges and universities you have to teach the rest of the people there the illiterate sections of our classes you see Uh, uh, of our of our lower classes. So how are you going to do it if you are in the habit yourself? You see, you have to be very cautious about this. So awareness, I think, that goes a long way. Finally, I would just like to say that since online classes are going to go on uh, for some time to come, at least for some uh, you know months to come, uh, young teachers uh, will have to be. Uh, much more clued up and much more imaginative uh, about ways in which online teaching can be made more interesting see for me i feel that a actual real routine regular class has no substitute where you are actually talking to the students and you are interacting with them and you are getting responses on an individual level and you can actually see how bored they are or how enthusiastic and you can tackle questions or any responses they might have there is nothing like an actual uh, regular class but we are compelled for some time to come at least to engage in online teaching and all of us will have to be clued up on that so how can you actually make this online teaching a little less theoretical and far more practical because see what happens is a lot of idealism gets talked about in india unfortunately we have this tendency that a lot of bhashan bhashi goes into uh, you know 
uh, solutions for problems, stereotypes, cliches, they have become the dominant culture. Now, simply for me to say, you know, we must restore our environment. But you know, you will always ask yourself, uh, 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 how can we do that at the individual level? That's why I spelled out some of these things, you see. Please stop using polythene. Uh, please see to it that, you know, you are as far as possible uh, avoiding the use of your own personal conveyance. So let's get down to the more practical aspects of life by which we can contribute and not just deal with theories or cliches. Can our online teaching of course, given the constraints of the curriculum, you will have to be theoretical, but can it be a little more minimalist and can it become a little more practical? Because things will have to be sort of cut down, I feel. It will have to be more encapsulated and you know, you cannot dwell at length. Whereas in the routine practice, if you are having a lecture on a subject for say two hours, or four hours, you might have to cut it down, you see, to one hour or much less than that. I mean, I feel this is how it might work in time to come. So can this more minimalist or basic approach, let me say basic rather than minimalist, uh, basic approach, can it be more practical rather than theoretical? And uh, uh, can it cater also as far as possible given the constraints of the online system, to each individual student's needs. I mean, how many students can we cover? If we have a class of 50, it's going to be very difficult. But as far as possible, even in the online system, if we can tackle responses, queries, sometimes students may be very shy in an actual class, and they may be a little more comfortable in a virtual class, you know, to come up with difficulties. They may feel a little more free, you know, and uh, I feel that might be possible. So, can you try and make it as individual based, as individual centric as possible? This is going to be a great challenge. So, many of the younger teachers who are technically going to be much more clued up than, you know, um, teachers of my generation, the older teachers, because you have studied computers in your school uh, uh, syllabus, school curriculum, and you know, you have a knack of picking up uh, these technicalities much better than the older people. You will have to think of ways in which to make online teaching much more creative, much more imaginative, much more fruitful. So I think these are the, some of the issues regarding mentoring that teachers will now have to be looking at, you will have to be looking at uh, several dimensions, several fronts, that is, you need to look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the environmental aspect, you see, uh, which is very important, I think, most important as far as I feel, something very close to my heart, you have to look at that aspect. You need to look at the whole issue of uh, how can we occupy ourselves, you know, make use of our free time more fruitfully, more creatively. And it is not just about reading or yoga or meditation. There are dozens of things to do. You see, uh, if we have not ever thought of learning a new language, this is the time to begin. If we have not uh, uh, seriously picked up a musical instrument, we have always wanted to learn, but we're too lazy to begin. This is the time to begin it, you see. So you can be creative in more ways than writing poems. Everybody cannot write poetry. It's not going to come to you. Everybody cannot start oil painting or watercolor painting. You may think of new ways that suit you, you know, whether it is photography, whether it is gardening, there are various ways in which, one way in which one can simply, uh, you know, help the environment is, uh, you know, the subject of ornithology. Uh, you know, there was a famous man, Salem Ali, who uh, was one of the, who was, I think, the Padma, uh, Padma Shri, the greatest ornithologist that India has produced. So you can take up ornithology, that is the study of birds, you see. 
as a hobby and uh, that is something that leads to environmental awareness you know you look at uh, how many birds uh, you can get to see in a natural environment like a garden in a for in a lockdown you cannot go to to a forest but when you can then the lockdown opens as it will soon then you know when you begin to move out and you begin to go to natural places like uh, forests for example you become a little more observant because you see forests are not just about tigers you see or um, you know animals like that that we have always wanted to see but it is also about all kinds of bird life so awareness regarding environment can take many dimensions and uh, i feel that young teachers have in the post covid scenario a very important role may i also in conclusion just mention this that so far very easily we got bored with the normal with the routine from monday to friday you know we were living our weekday monday to saturday our work day uh, lives and you know we were just waiting for sunday and then even sunday beyond the point became uh, you know a little boring because by sunday evening we were thinking of the next week so routine and regular life was always you know somewhat monotonous and somewhat uh, uh, tiresome to us now that is an attitude that is definitely going to change because routine regular normal life the normal life from monday to saturday is going to feel like bliss it's going to feel you know like a blessing once we return back to normal this is you know post vaccine uh, phase and we are all going to realize how much we have to be thankful for how much we can count as blessings this is also a spiritual attitude and let us inculcate this in our students that they have a great deal to be thankful for if they are privileged enough you know to get college education university education we are not born in the situation where we are seeing a migrant labor suffering for example you can see what tragedies are falling upon them the government is trying its best so let us not blame the government you know now there are modes of transport trains have started buses have started yet many of them many of this migrant labor class they are walking from place to place they you know there is this recent tragic incident of where they have lost their lives because they went off to sleep on a railway track you know so let's look at our lives and see how much uh, life has given us and uh, uh, can we stop complaining about regular life when we return and you know we want novelty and we want kicks all the time you know let's stop searching for those kicks whether it is you know in any form of entertainment or anything you know many of the young for instance turn to alcohol and to drugs or whatever for more novelty for more kicks but normal life is beautiful and it's a blessing as it is and that's something that i feel you need to uh, become much more conscious and aware of and teachers need to make students much more conscious of this to value the everyday life you see to count your blessings and to make the most of it so uh, i think this to some extent would help uh, junior faculty as well as you know research scholars who tomorrow may be teachers and uh, i would be happy to share my ideas with you even at a later stage should the, the situation arise should the opportunity arise and uh, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity thank you i am very much thankful to professor vp singh sir for this enriching session he has talked at length about the minimalistic mode of living and how to live in the way of encapsulation he is a constant source of support and encouragement to one and all thank you so much sir for your presence for your session on mentoring students in online teaching regular teaching post covid 19